powerful GeForce RTX graphics chip, Intel's all-new 14-core mobile processor, and Dell's plastic fantastic entry-level gaming laptop. Let's see how well this works. Recently refreshed for 2022, this new top-tier G155520 is equipped with an Intel Core i7-12700H 14-core CPU, 16GB of 4800MHz DDR5 RAM, and a 140 watt RTX 3070 Ti. Also included in this configuration are a 15 inch 165Hz 1080p IPS display with Advanced Optimus and G-Sync, a 512GB PCIe 4.0 SSD, AX Wi-Fi, 86 watt hour battery and an orange backlit keyboard. As you can see, there are all sorts of different options available on the Dell website for this laptop, so there really should be a configuration to suit almost anyone. There are two or three case color combinations depending on the exact model, and you can opt for a four-zone RGB keyboard. If you thought that was a lot of choice though, there's also a variety of AMD Ryzen equipped G15s to choose from too. The recommended retail price for this specific unit is $3,298.99 Australian, including tax, but of course, being a Dell product, you'll find these on sale more often than not. Of course, aggressive sale pricing doesn't automatically translate into a good ownership experience, so the real question is whether you should pick one of these up at any price. Hmm. In the boring but very eco-friendly brown box, you'll find the laptop itself, Dell's absolutely massive 240 watt power brick, and a small amount of documentation. Around the outside of the laptop itself, on the right hand side you'll find a pair of USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, the first of four exhaust vents, and a fluorescent orange G logo. On the rear we have two large vents, a Thunderbolt 4 Type-C port, another USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A, HDMI 2.1 output, and the DC in jack. And along the left hand side, there's one more exhaust vent, RJ45 Ethernet with a spring-loaded flap of doom, combo headphone microphone jack, and a battery status LED. This LED also doubles as a fault code indicator, so if your G15 stops starting up, check for a flashing light here. Compared to the original G15 5510, the new G15 is slightly thicker overall and has noticeably bigger ventilation openings to help cool the significantly more powerful parts. As always, the lid swings open very easily with no major flex, and the strong hinge assembly holds the display in position very firmly so you won't notice any screen wobble in normal use. Inside you'll find a fairly small trackpad with one of the worst integrated mouse buttons in the business, a full keyboard with number pad, and a large row of air intake vents. Around the display is a thick lower bezel, reasonably thin bezels at the sides and top, and above the screen is a small low quality webcam straddled by a pair of stereo microphones. The Windows Precision trackpad surface responds well without any noticeable input lag or stickiness. Unfortunately though, the button mechanism here is really bad. It's very inconsistent, loose and wobbly, and suffers from a double clicking issue that comes and goes over time, possibly due to dirt building up inside. Having a quick look at the trackpad from the inside, you can see that the trackpad and button are not an integrated unit, but instead the tracking surface loosely rests over a separate button assembly which is fixed to the palm rest area. This is not great for stability, and you can see how much flex there is in this design when I click the button from the other side. The keyboard on the other hand is very good. The keycaps are slightly undersized and the number pad is far too narrow, but the key mechanisms have nice firm feedback and I have no complaints about the layout. This all orange backlight is on the boring side, but the optional RGB keyboard is only a few dollars extra, so make sure to opt for that one if this will bother you. The LG IPS display in this G15 measures up pretty well, if not quite up to a standard that would be considered premium in 2022. Measured with an X-Rite i1 Display Pro Plus, brightness hit 324 nits, contrast comes in at a very good 1222 to 1, and the panel covers 95.8% of the sRGB color gamut, 73.7% of DCI P3, and 71.5% of Adobe RGB. It's important to note that there's no factory color calibration or preloaded color profile, so actual accuracy will vary wildly between units. Once calibrated, sRGB accuracy on this panel was fantastic. Dell do offer a 240Hz 1440p display with wider color gamut coverage and higher brightness for additional cost, and I'd recommend upgrading to that display if you're going to be doing any content creation. Advanced Optimus is fitted to this machine, but this is an unusually well-hidden feature, and Dell don't even mention it on the product page. This fully automatic system replaces the older style of MUX switch on laptops that required you to manually select a graphics chip and then restart the computer. If you open NVIDIA Control Panel and click into the Manage Display Mode tab, you'll see these three GPU selection options. Always leave this on Automatic Select. Now when you open up a game, you'll see the current status here changes to Discrete Graphics. 
This means you're now running the display directly from the dedicated graphics, bypassing the integrated GPU altogether. You'll also notice the G-Sync tab has appeared in the sidebar. On my unit, G-Sync was enabled by default, but it's worth clicking in here just to make sure it's set up properly. Note that Advanced Optimus is disabled entirely when an external display is connected to the HDMI port. This being a portable machine, you're quite likely to be interested in the battery life, and I don't have much good news here. With the display set to 70% brightness and sitting idle on the Windows desktop, I recorded just under 10 hours. However, at 100% brightness and with my usual mix of heavy internet use, the machine died after only 2 hours and 20 minutes. The balanced power profile was used for both of these tests. This very poor result was repeatable, and since no applications were unnecessarily using the dedicated GPU, this is clearly just a result of poor power management. Now it's possible that updates over time will sort this out, but you should never rely on future updates to solve problems, and for now, this laptop is close to useless away from a power outlet. DPC latency is once again an issue on this laptop. This is a long-standing problem that Dell seem either unable or unwilling to sort out. You'll occasionally get a noticeable pop or stutter in the audio, and I wouldn't rely on one of these for any live audio work. Now before we hit the thermal and performance data, I need to comment on the increasingly disastrous state of Dell's software for this line of laptops. Alienware Command Center should be your hub for changing thermal and power profiles. However, it began to flat out refuse to work properly after I'd had this laptop for only a few days. Here's what the main screen in the app should look like. Notice the power and fan profile settings toward the bottom right. Now here's what happens every time I try to open it up on the 5520. After an irritating wait, we get a user account control pop-up, and then a while later it loads into this. You can edit the power profile and fan settings from the Fusion tab, however you can't actually switch between them from here. I'll also call out the separate app that you're kicked into for changing sound profiles, Dolby Access. For starters, it's not particularly reliable. As you can see, on this attempt it just sits there for several minutes thinking. Once I lose patience and open it manually, it jumps into a home screen that's bordering on adware. Switching to the settings tab, oh, well, never mind, just don't bother. The speakers are pretty bad anyway, and this software does very little to help. So without Alienware Command Center working, you'll need to instead jump into the My Dell app to change between performance profiles, and this one's a bit painful. Digging through to the Power Manager section that would look more at home on a tablet, we have various settings for charging modes to preserve the battery, and a selection of four thermal modes under the adjacent thermal tab. The only one of these modes that will allow the GPU to hit its maximum 140 watts of power is Ultra Performance, which is the mode I use for all benchmarking. There is the usual G key on the keyboard to kick the fans up to maximum speed and theoretically improve performance by a small margin, however this isn't working properly. Either nothing happens when I press the button, or it does activate, but then refuses to turn back off, and the only way to stop the fans running at full speed is to shut the laptop down entirely. Fantastic. One last quick word about reliability. This specific unit, for some reason, is unable to successfully wake from sleep mode. Every time it's woken up, it briefly shows a black screen before rebooting into recovery mode. No helpful errors are logged in Windows Event Viewer, and after several BIOS reflashes and a Windows reinstall, I've given up on diagnosing the fault. At present, I can't confirm whether this is common on these machines, so please leave a comment if you have one and you've run into the same problem. The perceived severity of the fan noise on this laptop will be a little subjective. It's free from any lower frequency whines or other immediately annoying sounds, However, I found my ears screaming in agony after my several hour benchmarking sessions with this one. So while the sound signature of the fans is not particularly irritating, the actual volume of noise coming from the machine can be pretty intense. Here's a quick clip of the G15 loading into Cyberpunk to give you an idea of the change in sound levels as the fans spin up. You'll no doubt also have noticed Cyberpunk opened up somewhere off to the upper left instead of full screen. All games I tested on this laptop were prone to doing this occasionally. It's quite annoying and usually needs the game to be restarted to sort it out. External case temperatures tend to be noticeably warm all the time and can get very high in places under high loads. With a heavy game loaded up, you'll see the base of the laptop peaking at around 55 degrees Celsius, which would actually become dangerous if you had the machine sitting directly on your lap for a period of time. If you're gaming on the couch, you should always use a laptop stand of some sort. The upper deck gets quite warm, with the WASD keys hovering around 35 degrees and the center of the keyboard nudging 40. The peak temperatures at the rear shown by the red reticle are very high, but as this isn't a touch point, it's generally nothing to be concerned about. Palm rests generally stay under 30 degrees, which is a little warm, but not particularly irritating. Here's a side-by-side -side demonstration of the difference a laptop stand makes in a 21 degree room. 
On the left, the machine is sitting directly on the desk and on the right, it's elevated a few inches on a fanless stand. The GPU runs extremely hot while flat on the desk, indicating that there's nowhere near enough clearance underneath to allow adequate airflow to the intake vents. Not only is 86 degrees right up near the thermal throttling limit, it's also well outside of what I'd consider a safe temperature for a GPU long term. Propped up off the desk surface though, it's back under 80 degrees, which is good. You'll definitely want a stand or a cooling pad of some sort if you do pick one of these up. Now it's important to know how well a gaming laptop's power delivery and cooling holds up over time. So I've devised a thermal throttling test consisting of running Cinebench R22 on a continuous loop and capturing data at one minute intervals. The G15's Core i7 initially has 115 watts pumped into it, which proves far too much for the cooling system to handle, resulting in the CPU instantly hitting 100 degrees and throttling. It then briefly overcorrects, dropping power down to around 78 watts before stabilizing with both power and temperature sitting at 90 for the remainder of the test. At a constant 90 watts, the 12700H runs at 3.4 GHz on the performance cores. Now running the test again but throwing in MSI Combustor to load up the RTX 3070, the CPU initially receives 100 watts but over the next 5 minutes drops all the way down to 45, ultimately stabilizing at 2.3 GHz. The GPU is remarkably stable, hovering around 126 watts and 1440 MHz for the duration of the test. Looking at core temperatures, once again the i7 immediately smashes into the 100 degree thermal limit, eventually dropping down to a steady 81. The GPU temperature is initially brought up to 77 degrees by the intense heat from the processor, but eventually stabilizes at a pretty good 74. A quick word before we jump into some benchmarks. You should never shop for laptops solely based on benchmark scores, but instead include these results in a wider assessment of how well any machine you're considering fits your expectations for usability, reliability, durability, and after-sales support. Laptops are complex, tightly integrated machines, and the quality of your ownership experience will hinge on every one of these factors being satisfied equally. So if you skip straight to this section, I would urge you to consider going back and watching this video in its entirety before making a decision. So straight away, it's clear that the new 12th generation Core i7 is a monster of a CPU and absolutely the star of the show here. In Cinebench R23, you're looking at a multi-core score not far off what you'd expect from a 16-core desktop chip only a few years ago and by far the fastest mobile chip I've seen so far. The included Western Digital PCIe 4.0 solid state drive is a little disappointing, giving read and write speeds more like a PCIe 3 SSD, but given its tiny 512 gigabyte capacity, that's not too surprising. 3D Mark results designed to give us an idea of how the gaming performance will stack up are looking promising. CPU scores are definitely impressive, towering over the older high-end 8-core chips. 3D Mark's ray tracing benchmark, Port Royal, doesn't really show much of an improvement for the new 3070 Ti, which is actually quite surprising since the new chip has 15% more ray tracing cores than the older 3070. Now having a look at some actual gaming benchmarks, I've included runs with and without the Core i7's efficiency cores disabled through the BIOS, because it turns out that in some games there can be quite a difference in the results. Without the E cores active, the i7 functions as a normal 6 core 12 thread chip instead of the more complex big little setup with 6 performance cores and 8 small efficiency cores. To disable the efficiency cores, you'll need to reboot into the BIOS, head into the performance tab, and under multiple atom cores, change this setting to zero. Remember that performance in productivity applications will be substantially reduced, so you'll want to undo this change if you need the best performance in a heavy multi-threaded workload. Cyberpunk is within margin of error on both runs, and the new G15 does a great job of keeping the frame rate over 60 in the demanding ray tracing ultra preset either way. Watch Dogs Legion is a full 13.3% faster in average frame rate with the E cores disabled. 1% and 0.1% lows are significantly higher as well. Division 2 doesn't seem too fussed about the core configurations, and neither does Metro Exodus Enhanced, which is again roughly within margin of error and a strong showing either way. Far Cry 6 is completely unfazed by core configuration and runs extremely well. Borderlands 3, despite having a very similar average frame rate, gets more than double the 0.1% low result without the E cores. There's a very noticeable stutter in this game in the default configuration, which is alleviated entirely. Gears 5 shows a less dramatic difference in lows than Borderlands, however performance is clearly improved across the board with the E cores disabled. So moving on to the final chart, what I've done here is average out the gaming performance results for a number of different machines tested under identical conditions with identical settings, and then set the highest overall result to represent 100%. As you can see, the G15-5520 just barely manages to claw its way to the top here, and while the end result's less dramatic than the synthetic benchmarks would have led you to believe, this is still a great result that shows that the system isn't buckling under pressure and will give you the gaming performance you paid for. 
Two new additions to this chart are what I consider to be decent representations of both an entry-level desktop gaming PC with Core i3 and Radeon 6500 XT, and a more mid-range system with a Core i5 and GeForce RTX 3060. So if you're considering switching over to a gaming laptop, this might help you understand how various configurations will compare to a desktop machine. Right, let's tear this thing apart and check it out from the inside. Now you may be wondering what the point of this is. In simple terms, we're looking for the same things inside as we were on the outside quality of design, construction and assembly, and serviceability, which always becomes important later in a laptop's life. Note that Dell provides factory service manuals for all of their computers on the Dell support website. This is a fantastic resource for easy step-by-step -step instructions for any work you need to carry out on your machine. As always, initial disassembly is simple, with four captive screws popping the base cover out of its clips, making it easy to remove. The clips on this one were unusually stubborn, but after a brief argument, it did let me in. Once inside, you can see the 86 watt hour battery, M2 SSD, socketed Wi-Fi card, two DDR5 SO DIMM memory slots, both of which are populated, and Dell's insulting solution to last year's problem of not including a bracket for the second SSD, they've now just straight up not soldered in the socket for a second drive. This offers no benefit to you whatsoever, but simply saves Dell a few cents on board manufacturing and forces you to consider paying more for a larger SSD up front since you can't add another down the track. Thanks a lot, Dell. If you're unfamiliar with these G15s, you may also be surprised to see that the heatsink and fan assembly is not accessible from here. You will need to fully dismantle the machine and remove the motherboard to repaste the CPU and GPU and properly clean out the heatsink fins. Definitely not a service-friendly design. So let's press on. After disconnecting and removing the battery and an enormous amount of fiddling to remove all installed modules, the rear housing, and a dozen small cables and screws, the motherboard assembly eventually lifts out. Other than a few unimpressive build quality details like the speaker o-rings not installed properly or plastic backing left on this black tape implying a rushed assembly line, the structure under the top case is the same good design as last year with a large and solid magnesium frame supporting the display hinge and metal screw standoffs used throughout. The plastic casing may feel a bit cheap, but this is a strongly constructed laptop that should prove pretty durable in the long run. The air vents above the keyboard are mostly closed off, but the dust filter they've used this year is a less dense weave than in older generations to allow more airflow. The cooling system itself is a large but fairly basic quad heat pipe design, with two shared heat pipes and one additional pipe each for the CPU and GPU, which wrap around to secondary heat sinks on the side. Dell's design for the primary rear heatsink fin stacks is a little bizarre, with more than half the total height of the fins awkwardly protruding from the cooler in a narrow row and receiving zero direct airflow from the fans. This would assist with cooling to a certain extent, but don't let the size of the rear air vents fool you into thinking there's some ultra heavy duty cooling in here. On the plus side, there's very good cold plate coverage of all components, including voltage regulators and the PCH. I'm not too sure what this strange sandwich of a MOSFET, adhesive metal strip, capped on tape and a thermal pad are meant to accomplish, but we'll just pretend we didn't see that and move on. It's been quite a while since I've encountered an over-tightened screw on a new laptop, but irritatingly one of the six securing the heatsink on this one was jammed hard and threatening to strip out. After a few minutes of pain, it did come out without any damage, but make sure you've always got exactly the right size screwdriver for this sort of job because a slightly under or oversized driver will easily strip the heads on these weak screws. Now finally, after all that work, the heatsink comes off. Thermal paste application on both the GPU and CPU is great with full die coverage. We have what appears to be a 5 plus 1 phase VRM on the CPU and 5 plus 2 phase VRM on the GPU, which is definitely on the stingy side for such high wattage parts, but it does seem to do the job since there's no unexpected or excessive power throttling. The thermal pads for the voltage regulator components are very chaotically applied to the cooler, but appear to be making pretty solid contact. Lastly, the contact plates for the CPU and GPU definitely aren't machined to a mirror-like finish, but nonetheless, they're not too badly scored or pitted. I've definitely seen worse on other laptops, and thermal paste is designed to fill these small gaps anyway. Interestingly, the conformal coating applied over the Core i7 has a noticeable amount of pitting in the surface. It's hard to capture in a photo, but all these small white dots on the die are actually tiny pits that seem to have come from bubbles forming under the coating. Since it would be very risky to attempt to remove this coating from the chip in pursuit of improved temperatures, I'll be leaving this alone. Now, a major bugbear of mine with Dell's parts support for many of their laptop lines, including the G15, is that the LCD panel itself is not available as a replacement part. Instead, Dell only 
list to part number for the entire display assembly, including the front and rear plastic housings. In most cases, this will significantly increase the amount of plastic and e-waste going to landfill in the event that the screen is damaged, not to mention the increased cost for buying a number of parts you don't actually need. As you can see, in reality, it's very simple to remove the bezel from around the screen, which is held on with a few plastic clips and thin strips of double-sided tape. Now the LCD panel is simply held in by two strips of adhesive with a pull tab at the bottom on each side of the display, making removal easy. So despite Dell's environmentally unfriendly insistence that the display assembly is non-serviceable, in the event that you do crack or otherwise damage your display, you can simply source a compatible replacement panel and some double-sided adhesive and either swap it out yourself or take it to a local repairer. So overall, I'm in two minds about the G155520. On one hand, the updated processor and graphics chip are seriously powerful components and the new display options are an improvement over last year's model. The structure of this laptop is still reassuringly solid and Dell's after-sale support tends to be very good. Unfortunately though, my ownership experience so far has been quite poor. Between constant struggles with Dell's software, strange reliability faults, intense fan noise, high temperatures and completely miserable battery life, I would find it extremely difficult to recommend this laptop, especially at the elevated price you pay for these high-end specifications. Flaky quality of assembly and a hopeless trackpad just drive the point home. It's entirely possible that some or most of the issues I've encountered will be sorted out by future software updates, but as of June 2022, I'm going to say give this one a miss and look elsewhere. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please let me know. All feedback and suggestions are greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay safe and thanks very much for watching.